This is The Sporting Life on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. Here's Jeremy Schaap. David Duchovny has been a star now for decades, well known for his work on The X-Files, Californication, Aquarius. He's also an acclaimed novelist. His second novel, which we'll call on the show Bucky Bleeping Den, has been called a home run by both the New York Times and the Washington Post. It's out now in paperback, and Duchovny joins us. David, thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. Your protagonist is trying to write the great American novel, uh, but is selling peanuts at the same time at Yankee Stadium in that unforgettable season, 1978, uh, when the Yankees clipped the Red Sox. I I think they'd held uh, as large as a 14-game lead as late as August. Um, But the book's also about Ted's relationship with his father, who's seriously ill. Why is why is baseball the perfect backdrop for this story? Um, well, I think you know more than just baseball. It was the idea of, of Bucky Bleep and Dent, uh, and and of course he's a baseball player. And it was the idea um, espoused by the father at the end of the novel, which is you know life. You're never defeated in life by who you think is going to beat you by Mickey Mantle or Willie Mays or, or Reggie Jackson in this case. Uh, it's always Bucky Bleep and Dent. It's always the underdog. It's always the little guy you didn't see coming. And that life belongs to, you know, most of life belongs to the losers, to the to the people who aren't stars. And that became kind of the underpinning of the uh, book. And in baseball, that that often holds true as you know you know world series stars are often guys that come out of nowhere and just get hot and just rise to the moment and that's to me that's what's beautiful about baseball as opposed to most other sports at the at the highest level at at the world series moment it's often an unknown guy that comes to the front and you can't really say that about basketball and football and other sports you were um 18 years old when that game was played in October 78 yeah. in Fenway. You were a Yankees fan growing up. Um, but, of course, the Yankees you knew weren't the Yankees that, you know, 18-year-olds today have known who always made the playoffs and all that kind of stuff. Well, what, 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 what were you thinking as all of that was going on in the summer of 78? Well, at that point, you know, the Yankees had been good for a few years, I think. You know that 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 was the the Bronx's burning Yankees. Um, I was happy that the Yankees were winning, but but as you point out, I I grew up with Yankee teams at the tail end of Mickey Mantle's career uh, when he was no longer playing at the highest level, and you had guys like you know guys I loved. So I'm not uh, disrespecting them by bringing up their names and saying they're not great, like Horace Clark, Danny Cater, Mel Dottlemeyer, and then even into Bobby Mercer, who was a very good player. So I I I feel more like a Red Sox fan. Not that I root for the Red Sox, but just that I I felt like my teams were never good enough, never never made it. So when I write a book like Bucky Bleep and Dent, I'm really writing it with the heart of a guy who grew up rooting for for uh, mediocre teams, not for these kind of unstoppable force teams that the Yankees have become or that they were you know, with Babe Ruth and DiMaggio and Mantle before I became a fan. We're speaking with David Duchovny about his novel, Bucky Bleeping Dent, which is out now in paperback. Were you a Pepitone guy? (laughs) Yeah, I remember Joe Pepitone. Sure. I was a ball four guy, so I kind of fell in love with Joe Pepitone through through Bounton's book. You know, he was was a a lovable character in that book. You were a writer in your... Uh, youth as you are now, but you were focused specifically on writing when you were going to college, when you went to grad school at Yale. Um, uh, Ted writes a lot, but doesn't publish. Uh, how much of, of yourself do you see in Ted? Uh, some some of it. You know, that there's a lot that's that's uh, made up in Ted. I mean, he's he's of a slightly different generation than me. I was I was hamstrung by 1978. I had to fit the ages of the characters to make sense into that year because that's when when the historical thing happened. So by by that move, uh, Ted became a little older than me and had to have different cultural references than than I would have had growing up. 
Um, the Grateful Dead stuff really comes from uh, my brother was a big uh, deadhead. He loved the Grateful Dead. I never really listened to the Dead as a kid. Uh, they were a little before me, but I started listening to, to them to, to write the novel and, and got into them consequently. They were also a little bit after you. I mean, uh, <laughs> they, they, it lasted a long time. They are, they are as old as time and as current as time, I guess. The Red Sox in particular, among all the teams, not just in baseball, but in sports, um, have been an object of literary interest, uh, or at least they were when they were still struggling to break the curse. Uh, that tradition, um, w- which was a kind of pride in losing, H- how much of that informs the world you build in this novel? Well, that becomes the the epicenter, the moral kind of epicenter of, of the book. And and the if, if the book has a moral lesson, if the book has a morality, it's really about embracing the fact that uh, most of us are Red Sox back then, not Yankees. You know, most of us will live and die in obscurity and not get the ring. Great, great percentage of us will not get the, the brass ring. And that that's where the truth of life lies and that you have to find your pride and your love and your your sense of success through that failure, you know, and that's really the heart of the book. Um, so, uh, you know, temperamentally, I guess I'm more of a pre-2004 Red Sox fan than, than I am anything else. You kind of um, poke at, uh, you know, the the adage, but, but it seems you also subscribe to it that baseball is um, a metaphor uh, for life and a metaphor for, for the American experience. Well, it does seem to lend itself to writing uh, more than other sports. There's something about the, the pace of it. There's something about the... Uh, it's been around longer, I guess, in a professional venue than, than the other the other games. There, there's more of a sense of a tradition with it. But I think it's most... And it's association with summer, uh, the fact that it dies when mm-hmm. summer's dying. You know, every season dies at that point. There, there's a lot of rich stuff in baseball that lends itself to writing. And, and there have been great, great writers that I've enjoyed about baseball. And I, and I think, you know, the, the most the most beautiful sentiment about baseball that, I, that I've read, and I've actually cribbed it in the book, and I, I, I don't want to misattribute it, but I think it's Roger Angel, but I'm, I'm not sure. But one of the writers on baseball pointed out that it, it, it possibly could go on forever. You know, you don't have to make that last out, whereas all other games are, are done by are ruled by the clock, by time. So there's a sense of sense of beating mortality in baseball that if you never made that last out, you could somehow live forever. And that always, you know, obviously it's a, it's not true, but it's metaphorically true, and it it always struck me as a beautiful lie that baseball kind of has that that it could last that it could be summer forever that you could hit forever that you'd never make that last out and somehow you would be eternal we're speaking with david duchovny about his novel uh bucky bleeping dead out now in paperback and and before i let you go i should say if if i have uh any kind of claim to fame it's a rather pathetic one but it's being nine years old uh, attending that game at Fenway Park uh, with my father, who was a sports writer. Your dad wrote for the Post, didn't he? Not, I mean, he might have occasionally written for the Post. Uh, he was more closely associated with the Herald Tribune in the '60s. Then he was the sports editor of Sport, and he was. And um, we went up there for the day, and uh, kind of typical for my dad, you know, he didn't have tickets arranged for the game or anything like that. So we're standing around the batting cage before the game. He's asking the players who always had extra tickets, you know, anybody have any? And Bucky said, uh, yeah, I got a couple. Why don't you guys use my seats? Um, so I was sitting in, Buc- no way. yeah, I was sitting in Bucky's seats, uh, <laughs> or at least one of the two, with my dad when he hit the home run. Um, and uh, Bucky and I still still laugh about that. That's a phenomenal story. Yeah, we we we, we still laugh about that. It, it's it's also a good father son story because you know, and I was a big big Yankee fan, and after he hits the home run. Um, of course, my father had to work and go back to the NBC news station, in Boston, do something. So we missed the rest of the game, uh, but we did. We did get to see the. Home How run. would you describe that moment? How would you describe that moment 
when the ball cleared the wall in the stadium. I remember it. I, I remember the moment because it was an entirely foreign experience for me to be in in a stadium that wasn't Yankee Stadium, uh, in among a crowd that was rooting for the other team. And from my perspective, where we were, which was kind of like between like third baseline and up and the higher deck or something like that over on left field, I thought it was a foul ball. And because the crowd reacted the way it did without cheering, I thought it was a foul ball. And then when I realized it was a home run, I got very excited and I realized I was in deep danger and I quieted down. <laughs> um, Thanks so much for having been with us. Uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Um, David Duchovny's new novel, or novel now out in paperback, is Bucky Bleeping Dent. Uh, thank you. I'm Jeremy Schapp, and you can listen to new editions of The Sporting Life every Saturday morning at 7 Eastern Time, with re-airs Sunday mornings at 6 Eastern Time on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. This week on Sunday Night Baseball. Carissa lines the ball in the right field of base hit. Bryant's get the wave around third. The relay to the plate, not in time. Number three and number four in the latest ESPN Power Rankings. The Yankees and Cubs go head-to-head in Wrigley Field. Can the Cubs quiet Aaron Judge and the Bronx Bombers? Coverage begins at 7 Eastern on ESPN Radio and at 8 Eastern on ESPN. Presented by Firestone Tires. You're listening to Love Advice with Leanne. Caller, you're on the air. Uh, hi, Leanne. Long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> Why, in your professional opinion, do you never take my calls off the air? Is this Carl? Yep, it's Carl. I mean, we had a few dates. Everything was great, I thought. Uh... Well, you know, when you switch to GEICO, you could save a lot of money on car insurance. Okay, awesome. You should call them. I will. GEICO, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer.